countless people live and work in cities. That is why we must take efforts to ensure they thrive now and into the future. To this end, we have invited three experts who explore the different ways that cities can be made more sustainable and thriveable. They are Dr. Nicole Garifano, Head of Circular Economy Development at Planet Arc, Dwarkata Suresh, a retired professional and green enthusiast who has retrofitted his home with several ambitious, eco-friendly projects, and Sathish Moses, a transdisciplinary architect at SMLA.life. After their presentations, they kindly took questions from the audience. Before we start with the Q&A session, uh, I'd like to thank our speakers again for sharing their valuable knowledge and experience with us. And as I always say, with step by step and drop by drop, we'll certainly make a big change for a thrivable future. With that being said, mm -hmm. uh, we move on to our first question, which mm -hmm. is open to our speakers and anyone can uh, answer first. So the question is, what has been the most challenging aspect of circular economy that you have ever come across? Is it the cost implementation, the mindset of people or the organizations? Or is it about the clarity about the concept itself or the principles? Or, or is it the lack of awareness? I think it's a bit of both from my, well, it's a bit of everything really. Um, a lack of awareness from a circular economy perspective is very much part of it. Our research shows that knowledge and understanding of what a circular economy is and how to adopt innovation in this space is probably the greatest barrier. Um, and that is for people actually doing the work, but it's also about knowledge and understanding from the senior leaders who need to provide the approvals to actually start to explore these innovations. If they are not aware of the opportunities that exist, then there is less chance of being able to push through these new opportunities. So and understanding and awareness is, is really critical. Uh, there's also in our research show that financial barriers, so being if you're a manufacturer and you need to retrofit your lines, etc., then this is a major barrier to be able to invest in the finance, particularly when you don't have a guaranteed market for your innovation. Um, and in, in Australia, certainly there's still a relatively small market for some of these technologies. And I would also argue that behaviour change is you know, tied into the understanding and awareness, but we all need to change the way we engage with products and services. And that takes a lot of marketing on a, you know, on a very real and transparent marketing approach, but it also takes us getting comfortable with doing things quite differently to what we've been doing for the last 200 years. Um, does everybody need to own their own washing machine? Does everybody need to own their own vehicle? Does everybody need to own you know, their own everything, essentially. There are some things which we do need to own for various reasons, but I would challenge us to think about how we engage with products. Is it for the function or is it for the ownership? Thank you. I do agree with that, yeah. Just amplifying it is, we find a lot of restrictive mindsets, uh, each one sticking into a disciplinary insight spiral. So this is the domain and scope of work. So, but if you look at an environmental solution, come out of your already predefined boundary. So only if you start coming out of these boundaries, there is possibility of uh, collaborating, discussing, and uh, coming up with a comprehensive uh, strategy. So we need a lot of collaborative cross-thinking and coming out of the traditional silos that we are always used to. That, I think, is one of the uh, important areas that environmentalists should address. It is like the tripartite relationship uh, between society, economics, and environment. So all the three has to go and so without that, despite that, to really approach the subject king into the uh, commandment. That is my take on it. Yeah, thank you, uh, Sureshi. Yes, sir. Uh, what do you think is the most challenging aspect of the circle economy? that you ever come across? The mindset. People are not aware of it. And uh, there's no awareness. It is trickling in now slowly. People like us, I'm a one-man army, thank you. Talk to people to do it. For example, I would insult that large 1,000 kg per day waste where they are spent in a college. 
thousand hostel students put less clothes in the biogas pan, and that biogas is used for cooking their food. So this is the ideal circular economy. But even after doing it in one college, five years ago, not a single other college has started. No other hostels have started this. It is a question of mindset only. It is going to take time to convince people. But slowly things are happening. Yeah, thank you. So, Rishi, I'll come to you with the specific question. Uh, in your presentation, you discussed about your home-based projects, and I understand that you had enough space to ac accommodate all of them. Uh, what is your advice to people who may not have enough space and are willing to take such initiatives? You need not do all the seven projects, but you can do one, two, three, whatever is possible. Actually, you don't need much space. For rooftop solar, you need a roof space only. For every kilowatt, you need about 100 square feet, shadow-free area. Biogas plant can be installed in the balconies. Hydroponics can be installed in the terraces. All these things are possible. All these are, you, you need not do all the seven. Do one, two, three, whatever is possible. It is possible. Again, it's a question of mindset. Think positively, we can do something. If you have a negative mindset, you can't do anything. I've done more than 100 installations in Chennai, Bangalore, Hyderabad of rooftop solar. I've done hydroponics in a two factory terraces, two school terraces. Terraces are all non productive assets, so you have to use the terraces now. If you can't do it in your house, your flat, do it in other places. Motivate people to do it. Yeah, thank you. I agree on that. It's more about the mindset rather than taking those steps. Nicole, I'll come to you. Uh, so during your presentation, you talked about the ladder of circularity. So while climbing through those, uh, through that ladder of circularity, and have, which is having those 10 hours, I asked myself, why not have rescue as a part of the ladder? We take a lot of raw material uh, from the nature, and as it includes plants and animals, Many times they are not in the happiest place. Something like Amazon deforestation, whale ambergris extraction. Could you share your thoughts on this, please? Thank you. Yeah, rescue is an interesting thing, isn't it? It does come down to the language. And I, and I think this is interesting that the, what we see is the ladder of circularity. And look, it depends on which paper you read as to whether it's 10, 7, 6 or more sometimes. Um, but what we, what's central is that we're taking the traditional model of the waste management hierarchy, which has been around since the 19, late 70s, 80s, um, out of the European Commission. And we're, we're really, uh, advancing or expanding the reuse of that five step hierarchy. So where does rescue fit? I guess rescue fits kind of in the recover space i'm just going to refresh my memory repurpose space we're rescuing for repurpose um i think at the end of the day whatever the language is that you use if you are adopting an approach which has a higher value proposition for that product or material you can call it what it is, but at the end of the day, we just want to move be up, move above that recycling. And ideally, refuse is the very first one that we should all be considering. And I think if we look at, you know, this this question of consumption, it's always a very difficult question. Consumption is at the heart of everything that we're talking about here. If we didn't consume as much, would we have the same issues to deal with? Um, you know, that's for a debate for another day. But I think it does challenge us to really think about how do we consume, what do we consume, and for what purpose and for what length of time. Um, you know, the, the concept of um, sharing vehicles, car shares, like in Australia we have this company called GoGet, um, probably one of the earlier models of this type of thing. But even before we had GoGet, where you pay, you, you you get a code, you turn up, you unlock the car and you use it for a period of time, a few hours a day or whatever. We've been sharing cars for years. Car rental companies have been around for decades. And so this isn't necessarily anything new. It's actually about rethinking our engagement with what we need on a daily basis to really get higher value from it. So whatever you want to call it, 
go for it. It's just getting better value out of the materials. Thank you for that discussion. Thank you for the answer. Satish, I'll come to you. Uh, world is seeing India as a rising startup hub. According to you, what kind of opportunities one can avail through related Indian government policies in implementing initiative to build resilient ecosystems such as the breathable homes that you discussed during your presentation? Yeah, uh, well, the, uh, I would say for the climate-based startups, the concept of social enterprising is very important. See, uh, there is always this uh, non-profit and you have a profit venture. But mostly a climate-based startup requires something big crowd. You need to have a very strong sensibility of why you are doing it. That can come only from a cost-based or a non-profit approach. But still, sustenance and, uh, I mean, sustenance of that can come only profit-based approach. So, forming cooperatives, especially in the agenda of climate change, circularity, so we cannot just go either to the left or I say we are a non-profit or we are a profit-based organization. We need a sustainable cost-based approach. So I would call it a social enterprise where we bring in a lot of communities and it's still it's a very sustainably profitable venture. So I think that is the direction where I mean, India in the total picture should look at. And also globally, these are, I mean, I had the discussions with uh, some of my friends in South Africa. So all these social enterprise models has to start coming in. So that is one of the areas which I think uh, should be highlighted. Many of these activities need not necessarily be on NGO basis. We are, I am connected to a company which is a for profit making company. We are collecting waste, segregating it and giving it to industry. Multiple objectives. One is employment generation. Secondly, waste management. Third, waste management is used for productive purposes. This is a for-profit company. It's not an NGO. Thank you for those thoughts. Um, now, I have one question from the audience uh, for Satish. Um, the the audience would like to know how about the how about the uh, the cost of material compared to the traditional materials when you talk about the uh, breathable homes. See uh, the same uh, house. Uh, it required actually one fifty cubic meter of concrete. So whereas if you look at the cost of concrete to the uh, one fifty cubic meter of a uh, byproduct, it's coming from another uh, mining resource. So you are able to actually save as much as 30% of the total volume cost. So, and it is also a, a direct method of using less of cement. So where we are looking at carbonation set instead of hydration set. So we are, we are finally at the end of the day. And definitely it is quite costly because we have to train the community. So there uh, we are looking at a 15% more cost. Uh, component compared to a conventional model. So, on a net average, you balanced out the material resource component and the uh, the labor component. We are looking at a 15% lesser cost than the conventional uh, system of practice. Because uh, these approaches have to really uh, showcase the cost benefit to really pick up and get an acceptance in the larger uh, societal penetration. So, definitely it is 10 to 50% cheaper than the current uh, options which are available. So what I understand from this is that it can be, these kind of houses, houses can be built in any geolocation or any under and any climate uh, zones, right? Yeah, we, we've tried uh, experimenting in Aldips. So we are in discussion on how can actually respond to humidity and how it will respond to an hot and dry climate. So and what kind of composite change we have to develop in this. So for hot and dry and hot and humid. Basically, the core fundamentally will remain the same. But what is the kind of customization depending on the climatic zone that we are working on? So that is something which uh, we are slowly developing at work. Nicole, I have one question for you. Um, Europe is now ramping up its investment in defense spending, which is both heavily fossil fuel dependent and destructive. 
what can we as citizen do to promote sustainability in this societal climate? Uh, this is the question from one of our audience based okay. in Finland. At the end of the day, uh, we as both individuals and representatives of, you know, organizations of whatever your organization is that you affiliate with, we can do what we can do as citizens. And I believe that, you know, the, the question of globally, why are we spending money on defense? Because we have wars that are occurring around the world. I'm not going to go into that into that discussion, but I do believe that we as individuals do have the opportunity to direct and guide our community collective power in what we decide to purchase and what we decide to invest in. And also, you know, it's the old adage around we vote who we want in. I mean, you know, in, in some countries that's not necessarily the case, but certainly in Europe, most countries are democracies. And so I feel that we as, and I, and I, I should say as, as an individual, I have these challenges myself. Sometimes I, I wonder what is my role in this? How am I actually enabling sustainability? How am I actually enabling circular economy? And I sometimes wonder, is it worth it? Because I'm one person. But I do also then am reminded of the collective of individuals that I'm surrounded by who all together, when we put our efforts together, actually are making a very strong voice for circular economy in Australia. And we are gaining momentum, we're gaining attention. So as a citizen, I believe that I need to keep doing my small pieces, engage with others who are doing other their bit in their area, and then come together periodically to really identify and map that work that we're all doing together and showcase what can achieve. I mean, we've heard from Suresh, Suresh today with his examples. Let's just keep doing the bits that we're doing as citizens, but importantly, share what we're doing together, both with each other, but also with those that have the power to change policy. If I could just jump in. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. What Nicole is saying is, is uh, and everyone else here with sharing their uh, stories and, and their insights, is it's a collaborative effort. There is no one organization, big or small, uh, you know, throughout the world, philanthropic group, whatever it may be, that can actually get us across the line. It's really a collaborative effort among all of the people that are well informed or informed enough to actually transition us towards a thrivable future. So uh, yeah, this is the work that um, these leading organizations and individuals are doing on the ground, actually, you know, rolling up their sleeves, getting in there and actually making that change that we want to see happen in the world, rather than sort of just being a spectator, hoping that some government or some organization is going to come forward and do it. It's not going to be that way. It's really going to be the sum total of us as individuals that are going to make that change in the in the long run. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Morris, for sharing those thoughts. Uh, I'll quickly squeeze in one question uh, for Sureshi. Uh, many of us believe that uh, biogas process comes with lots of odor. Can you please talk more on this and how it can be managed effectively? Or it's just a myth? There is no order, no, there is no daily maintenance. But thing can be simpler. You just take the kitchen waste, uncooked, spoiled, excess food, vegetable what you peel off, just feed it into the biogas plant. As simple as that, gas comes automatically, the slurry comes out automatically. There is no order generator. Thank you. As I mentioned, we are running short of time, and this restricts me to ask further questions. I was enjoying this session. Uh, but I would request uh, our speakers to answer the remaining questions offline. And for our viewers, do sign up for our newsletter to get access to these Q&As and latest updates. With that, thank you very much.